Maureen Brubaker was born on July 4th, 1954, and everyone believed she would be a firecracker because of her patriotic birthday. This prediction would turn out to be accurate, with her mother Marianne later describing her as the wild child of the family. Maureen was the oldest of seven children, and was a loyal and loving sister to her four brothers and two sisters. The earliest memory her sister Lisa, who was 13 years younger than Maureen, has is of sitting on Maureen's lap in a car, with Maureen's husband driving them around one night. Maureen was trying to teach her to sing the Christmas carol, Silver Bells, as they listened to it on the radio. Maureen would babysit her younger siblings for her parents, who knew that handling so many young children was a challenge, so they offered their younger children 10 cents each if they behaved for their sister while they were gone. Even if the younger children fought with each other or otherwise misbehaved, Maureen would always report to her parents that they had all behaved wonderfully for her when they returned home, so that all of her siblings would receive their dime. As close as she was with her family, Maureen was also somewhat of a typical teenager, in that she did not always listen to her parents or do what they thought was best. When she was 16, Maureen asked her parents if she could marry her boyfriend, David Farley. They told her they did not like the idea of her getting married, but Maureen and David married anyway. Maureen's parents could have asked the court to annul the marriage, but Maureen threatened to leave home and never speak to them again if they did, so they did not pursue that option. Shortly after the marriage, Maureen's husband David was arrested. Police have not publicly disclosed what he was charged with, but the Brubakers believe he was arrested for burglary. David was sent to the Anamosa State Penitentiary outside of Cedar Rapids, Iowa, to serve his short sentence. Maureen moved to Cedar Rapids so she could visit her husband while he was incarcerated. Her younger siblings were upset by the move, as Cedar Rapids was on the opposite side of the state as their home in Sioux City. Maureen rented a room in Cedar Rapids and found a job nearby as a waitress at Wada's restaurant. She wrote letters and sent photos to her family regularly and called them when she had the money to. On September 17, 1971, Maureen borrowed some money to buy a pack of cigarettes. Her paycheck from the restaurant would be ready later that day, so she would quickly be able to pay back the money. However, she never came to the restaurant that night to collect the paycheck she so desperately needed as she was out of money. She likewise did not arrive at the restaurant for her shift on Monday the 20th, which was unusual for the dependable employee. Her co-workers were worried about her, so they went to her rented room to see if she was there. She was not, so they reported Maureen missing to the police. Police in Cedar Rapids contacted their counterparts in Sioux City to have them check if Maureen had simply gone to visit her family. When the police arrived at the Brubaker family home, they asked if Maureen was there and informed the family she was missing when they learned she was not at the house. Maureen's father was unable to get off work and her mother had to stay to care for her youngest children, but two of Maureen's siblings made the four-hour drive to Cedar Rapids to help look for her. Maureen would not be found until a week after she was last seen alive. On September 24, 1971, two teenage boys were out hunting in a wooded area, approximately three miles away from Maureen's rented room. In the bed of an abandoned truck in a wooded ravine near what was then a landfill and is now Tate Cummins Park, they saw a woman lying down with one leg propped up. She was wearing clothes, but no shoes. The two boys assumed she was sleeping and continued on their way. When they passed by the area again, however, they noticed that the woman in the truck was in the exact same position she had been in when they saw her earlier. They decided to approach the truck to get a closer look. When they did, they saw that the woman's skin was discolored and realized she was dead. The woman in the truck was Maureen Brubaker Farley. She was just 17 years old at the time of her death. Maureen had been struck in the head, which had resulted in a severe skull fracture. Based on the level of decomposition, authorities believe Maureen had not died until several days after she sustained the injury. She would have been unconscious during the time between the injury and her death. There were also indications that she had been sexually assaulted. Police believed Maureen had been killed elsewhere and then later placed in the truck. 
When police began investigating the murder, they found no signs of struggle inside of Maureen's rented room, and her car was still parked outside. They conducted interviews, but were never able to make an arrest. Maureen's killer would remain unidentified for decades, until advances in science and technology provided new uses for evidence preserved in the case. In 2006, cold case investigators submitted a swab taken from Maureen's body to the lab to see if there was any unknown DNA present. A full DNA profile from an unknown male was developed from semen found on the swab, but there was no match to the profile in criminal databases. The case was looked at once again in 2017, and investigators began collecting DNA samples from suspects who had been identified in the early days of the investigation to compare their DNA to the DNA found on Maureen's body. More than 15 suspects were cleared through this effort. Police could not collect a DNA sample from one major suspect because he had died in 2013 at the age of 94. The man in question had worked at a liquor store near the restaurant where Maureen had worked, and was a regular customer of hers there. He reportedly was friendly to her and offered to help her with her car. Maureen's mother, Marianne, had written to police six months after her daughter's murder, telling them that she believed he was the person who had killed Maureen. Police were also suspicious of this man. He had been interviewed extensively, but had refused to take a polygraph. He had continued to visit the police station in the months after Maureen's murder, asking about the investigation. Police found this suspicious, but had no evidence to show he was responsible for Maureen's murder. That changed in the spring of 2021, when police were able to obtain a search warrant, allowing them to collect a DNA sample from the man's daughter for comparison to the male DNA found on Maureen's body. The sample was collected and sent to the lab. On September 24th, 2021, 50 years to the day after Maureen's body was discovered, Police received the results of the analysis from the lab. Testing confirmed that the DNA found on Maureen's body had come from the father of the woman whose DNA had been submitted, the man the Brubaker family had long suspected, George M. Smith. Maureen's father passed away in 2002. Two of Maureen's brothers also passed away before learning who killed their sister. Maureen's mother and four surviving siblings are satisfied with the evidence and the formal closure of the case. While Smith may not have had to face justice in this life, Maureen's mother believes he will still face consequences and is relieved she and her family have some measure of closure. We just figure he'll suffer in hell for it, Marianne Brubaker told the Sioux City Journal. What's done is done and at least we know it was him and we can quit wondering. We can let it go. On Thursday, June 9, 1977, 17-year-old Eric Goldstrand and 16-year-old Leanna Edank went out for a day of fishing and swimming at the Broken Bowl Picnic Grounds near Fall Creek, Oregon. The high school sweethearts were on summer break from North Eugene High School in Eugene, Oregon, where they each had a close group of friends. The couple drove east on Highway 58 in Eric's truck with the picnic lunch Eric's mother had prepared for them. The couple was supposed to be home by 10 o'clock that night, but they did not arrive as scheduled. Earlier in the evening, Eric had called home to tell his father he was having problems with the truck. He asked him to come looking for him if he and Liana did not arrive home on time. Eric's parents, Ted and Donna, therefore then drove out to the picnic area. There, they located the truck, but not Eric and Liana. Their clothes were inside of the truck, so Ted and Donna knew that wherever their son and his girlfriend were, they were only dressed in their swimsuits. Eric's parents then notified law enforcement, and a Lane County Sheriff's deputy arrived on the scene to help search for the two missing teenagers. The deputy and Ted went out to search, while Donna stayed behind with the truck. They located Liana's body in a secluded area within the picnic grounds. She had been raped and then shot. Ted took Donna home for the evening, telling her the search would resume in the morning. He did not tell her that Liana had been found dead, and that the picnic area was now a crime scene. The next morning, Eric's parents were notified that Eric's body had also been found, several hours after Liana was located. 
His body was found in a group of bushes, and he had also been shot. An extensive investigation was launched to find Liana and Eric's killer. A massive search was held, and roadblocks went up throughout the area in the immediate aftermath of the murders. Numerous interviews were performed, and polygraph examinations were administered. Several bullets and suspect firearms were examined. Fingerprints were found at the scene, but at the time, no match could be found to them. Despite ongoing efforts, no arrests were made in the case. Detective Ken West was first assigned to work Liana and Eric's case in 1983. He later retired and began volunteering one day a week with the Lane County Sheriff's Office cold case team, working alongside Chuck Tilby, who had retired after three decades with the Eugene Police Department, and Kirk Engdahl, a retired state and federal prosecutor. DNA evidence had been found and preserved at the crime scene, but there was little investigators could do with it in 1977. Decades later, however, this would be the evidence that finally identified the young couple's killer. In July of 2020, the DNA from the scene was run again, and Parabon Nanolabs was brought in to analyze the profile. They were able to generate an image of what the killer may have looked like based on his DNA. They also used genetic genealogy to try to identify him based on his relatives. They ultimately determined that the killer was most likely one of three members of a family from Oak Ridge, Oregon. Only one of these family members was still local. Investigators were able to surreptitiously collect the butt of a cigarette he had smoked, and the DNA found on it eliminated him as a suspect. This left two brothers, who were then living in Mesa, Arizona, as potential suspects. Authorities in Oregon began arranging to collect their DNA and bring the case to a grand jury once they conclusively determined which brother was their suspect. However, on February 24, 2021, the two brothers got into an altercation. The younger of the brothers was injured during the fight, and the police were called. Before they arrived on the scene, the older brother took his own life. While he will never know for sure, Kurt West suspects that the older brother may have ended his life rather than come in contact with the police in part because his involvement in Liana and Eric's murders, and the DNA he had left at the scene, may have still been at the back of his mind. The surviving brother cooperated with police, answering questions about his older brother. Delays in the final DNA testing went on for months, but on September 23, 2021, more than 44 years after Liana and Eric were killed, the Lane County Sheriff's Office announced that the DNA found at the crime scene belonged to Ronald Albert Schroy. Schroy had been 23 years old at the time of the murders, and had recently been discharged from the military. He was a Lane County resident in 1977, but left Oregon in the early 1980s, eventually moving to Mesa in 2008. It's a relief he's not going to be able to hurt anyone again, but there's a part of us who wanted to see him and know why, and all these things we're never going to know. Liana's cousin, Kathy Kloster, said after Shroy's identification. Eric's mother, Donna, does see a silver lining in Shroy's suicide, as she was terrified of having to go through a trial, and what could happen if Shroy somehow managed to get acquitted. The DNA testing performed in the case by the Cold Case Unit was funded with donations made to the unit by the public. Liana and Eric's families are grateful to the investigators who never gave up on the case. They hope the resolution of the case will give hope to other families still waiting for answers in cold cases and serve as a reminder to criminals that while they may not have been caught yet, they may still one day have police come knocking on their door. In July of 1991, 17-year-old Patricia Moreno, known to her loved ones as Trisha, was in the care of the Department of Social Services. She had been living in one of their foster homes on Henry Street in Malden, Massachusetts, for the past two months. Trisha's foster mother did not allow smoking inside the home, so Trisha would often go out onto the third floor apartment's fire escape to smoke cigarettes. The fire escape is where Trisha would be found at approximately 3 a.m. on July 20th, having been shot in the head. 
Trisha was rushed to Massachusetts General Hospital, where she died as a result of her injuries 12 hours later. An arrest in Trisha's case would not be made for 30 years. On September 29, 2021, Middlesex County District Attorney Marion Ryan announced that a grand jury had returned an indictment for first-degree murder and that 48-year-old Rodney Daniels of South Fulton, Georgia, had been charged in connection with Trisha's murder. He had been arrested without incident at his home in Georgia on September 27th and would be extradited back to Massachusetts. Daniels had been dating one of the two teenage daughters of Trisha's foster mother and sometimes stayed at their apartment. In 1991, he told police that he had been asleep on an armchair in the apartment's living room when he was awoken by two gunshots. He went out onto the fire escape where he found Trisha, critically injured. Trisha's foster mother then called 911. Police learned that Daniels had been aggressive and threatening towards Trisha during her time in the foster home. According to court documents, Trisha had reported that she had awoken one night shortly before her death to Daniels standing in her bedroom. He had a gun in his hand, which he then pointed at Trisha's head. Trisha's foster mother never reported this to the police or to the Department of Social Services. These same documents detail accounts of Daniels bragging about the police failing to find gunpowder residue on him and telling Trisha's foster mother, yes, you can, after she said that a person could not get away with murder. Police were able to confirm that Daniels had been in possession of multiple handguns prior to Trisha's murder. In 2020, Trisha's case was re-examined by the Middlesex District Attorney's Office Cold Case Unit, which had been formed the year before. They returned to the apartment where Trisha had been killed and meticulously recreated the crime scene. They determined, based on the angle of the bullet that killed Trisha, that her killer had fired the fatal shot near the door back into the apartment she had been living in. In addition, investigators were able to locate a witness who had just returned to the United States after an extended period of time outside of the country. He had lived in a second floor apartment in 1991 and had been awoken by the gunshots when Trisha was killed. Because of the location of his bed in his bedroom and the location of his window, when he woke up, he was looking directly out at the crime scene. He was able to provide police with a description of the man out on the fire escape with Trisha, and more importantly, he reported that he had seen the man go inside of Trisha's apartment after the shooting. There had been no signs of forced entry into the apartment, and no one who had been known to be inside of the apartment had reported seeing anyone else there. Trisha's foster sister, Chantel, who had been dating Daniels at the time of the murder, testified on his behalf at a 1991 grand jury hearing. However, in private, she told her younger sister, Rochelle, that on the night of the murder, Daniels had confessed to her that he had killed Trisha and then hid the gun in a hole in the chair where he slept in the living room. He told her later he had gotten rid of the weapon. Rochelle had begged Chantel to go to the police with his information throughout the years that followed, but Chantel never would. She feared getting into legal trouble for lying to the grand jury to protect Daniels originally. Chantel died of COVID-19 in 2020, and Rochelle told police about what Chantel had told her about the murder and her dishonesty during a 2021 interview with them, since Chantel could no longer face any legal consequences. Daniels was arraigned in Middlesex Superior Court on September 30th. He is being held without bail and is due back in court on October 21st.